Welcome to KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio and the Southern California Business Report with Yvette Walker, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Welcome and thank you for joining Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM, and KMET TV. I'm Yvette Walker, live, blasting our signal from the center of Southern California, serving a population of over 25 million. Get us crystal clear and on demand by downloading the free live streaming app on Google Play and the Apple App Store. As Always a huge shout out to the team, Mitch, Bill, and Sean. I love you guys. And to our special advisory committee that can be found at www.scbrtalk.com backslash advisory committee. Check out these amazing leaders doing the work. All right, everybody. Today, I have the distinct privilege to introduce Dr. Raymond Wolf. He is the executive director of the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority, SBCTA. He joined SBCTA in April of 2012 after spending more than 20 years with the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans. At Caltrans, Dr. Wolf served in many capacities, including Director for District 8, covering both San Bernardino and Riverside counties. He began his career as an aerospace engineer at General Dynamics Corporation. As the Executive Director of SBCTA, he manages a budget of approximately $1.1 billion and oversees the delivery of planning, design, and construction of freeway improvements, bridges, and railroad crossings operation and expansion of commuter rail and transit services countywide, management of air quality programs and freeway service patrol, implementation of alternative fuel and energy programs, and advocating for countywide interests both at the state and federal levels. Dr. Wolf received his doctorate in civil engineering from the University of Southern California, a Master of Science degree in civil engineering from the California State Polytechnic University in Pomona, and a Bachelor of Science degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Southern California. He is a registered civil engineer and a registered mechanical engineer in the state of California. Thank you so much for being with us here today, Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Yvette. Thank you for that introduction. What an incredible, deep knowledge in engineering and infrastructure. I'm really excited to get going on this conversation. But as you know, the first question I ask each and every one of my guests is to walk us through your journey and talk about what inspired you to now becoming the executive director of the SBCTA. Well, you know, you mentioned that my undergraduate degree is in aerospace engineering, and my first job was actually blowing things up. I worked for General Dynamics in their missile systems division, uh, testing missiles, uh, prototype missiles. And as you can imagine, uh, being a young man out of college and not at the military and being able to blow things up was pretty fantastic. However, uh, the Berlin Wall came down and, and I had to look for other employment. And that's what led me to the state. And one of the things that I, I find really intriguing with, the, whether it's the job I had at Caltrans or the job I have today, is you have this opportunity to build something that leaves a legacy, right? And so, you know, whether you're you're adding a lane on a freeway, whether you're building additional track miles uh, for a railroad, you're, you're building something that people can see it's tangible. And you can point this out to, to your, your family and your friends and say, I had a part uh, uh, to do with that. It's, it's a fantastic career in transportation. Amazing. So um, can you please talk a little bit, just a brief overview of um, key projects in San Bernardino County today? So uh, we, we continue to build a lot of capacity on freeways. It's important given the co- continued growth of containerized goods uh, we're running through the San Pedro ports. But we are also investing significant uh, amounts of money in adding capacity on our railroads, the Metrolink system in the eastern part of the San Bernardino Valley. We're just breaking ground on a uh, high-frequency bus rapid transit line that will connect from the Ranch Cucamonga Metrolink station down through Ontario International Airport, and then west along Hope Boulevard all the way to the Pomona downtown Metrolink station. So we're creating connectivity with different modes of transit as our communities are growing and demanding more opportunities for, for, you know, different modes of transportation. 
I think one of the, the more exciting projects is, is actually a private project that's coming in, and that's the Brightline West high-speed electrified train service that's going to connect to that Ranch Cucamonga Metrolink station uh, and then across the state line into Nevada to go to Las Vegas. Uh, they're going to break ground within the next uh, couple of months, and I'll, I'll offer that they will be the first operating high-speed rail in the United States and the first, certainly the first interstate. And that's going to be transformational to us here in the Inland Empire to have a node of that significance. Uh, and so from that, we are building, working with Metrolink to look at increasing the service frequency along the San Bernardino Metrolink line, which connects through that, that Ranch Cucamonga station to serve as a feeder for that uh, Brightline uh, high-speed train connection. We're, we're starting environmental work on a tunnel connection from that same Metrolink station to south to Ontario International Airport, just about four miles south. Um, the reason we're looking at a tunnel connection there is we want to introduce autonomous technology. And so we're creating a closed environment to, to introduce that autonomous uh, vehicle technology. So that's really exciting. Uh, we are pioneering the first self-propelled hydrogen train in North America. In fact, that vehicle is expected to be delivered here in San Bernardino County uh, within a couple of months for final testing and then introduction into service in the Metrolink system. So there's a lot of really exciting things that are going on in San Bernardino County today. And it's just, like I said earlier, it's fantastic to be a part of all that. It really is. And, you know, the common theme that you hear about, you know, San Bernardino County is how innovative and how advanced uh, the projects are when you look at the county as a whole, you know, breaking uh, records um, from uh, county awards. Um, it's just, it's remarkable. And it's very exciting to be here in this county at this time. Like you said, Brightline, uh, the only uh, transportation of its type in uh, America, right, North America, is just, it's a badge of honor honor for the county and the residents, um, which I'm so excited to share today because, um, you know, sometimes when you talk about these things, it's like, really, this is happening in our community. So it's, it's great to be able to share that. Um, so with that said, uh, Dr. Wolf, please talk about some of the key goals and objectives of the San Bernardino County Transit Authority in terms of improving transportation infrastructure in the region. So we're a growing county, right? The population continues to grow year in and year out. Uh, the affordability of houses out here is, is much better than it is in the coastal counties. And so we're attracting people, we're attracting businesses out here. And so with that, uh, we need to continue to invest in the infrastructure. The other thing that I spoke briefly of earlier is the movement of containerized goods through the San Pedro ports. A lot of the logistics and warehousing has sort of moved out into the Inland Empire, whether it's San Bernardino or Riverside County. And so we have to make sure that we are building the capacity necessary to move those goods because it's not only important for our local economy, it's important for the state's economy and our national economy. I like to say that the ports, the San Pedro ports are the gateway to the Asian marketplace, but San Bernardino County is the gateway to America in terms of containerized goods movement. And so those are important aspects that we need to pay attention to across the board, which is why we're investing in the entire suite of projects. So we've got highway projects and we've got transit projects. Right. So with that said, Dr. Wolf, please touch on the Barstow International Gateway, a logistics hub that, like you said, is going to be the gateway to the rest of America and how that uh, private um, project is going to enhance the lives of San Bernardino County residents. Yeah. So this is a uh, project by Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Um, they have purchased 4,500 acres out in the western part of the city of Barstow with the intent to build a, a large intermodal facility. Their plan is to do more than just to build an intermodal facility where you move the containers around. They're also going to have warehousing and logistics located out there. And the idea being that the containers that arrive through the, the San Pedro ports that are destined for markets outside of California will actually move by rail through the Metro Valley area here, the LA Basin, instead of by truck. Uh, and that's obviously going to uh, be a huge help to us in the transportation world because, you know, the, we, 
getting rid of trucks is is an important element in helping us to solve the congestion problems and, and the air quality challenges that we have. Um, we won't get rid of all trucks, uh, and trucks are an important part of what we do in, in our local economy. But moving those trucks and those containers that aren't going to be distributed here locally, moving them via rail to this new facility uh, outside of the greater metro, uh, metropolitan area, and then you know, repackaging them and shipping them via truck or rail to markets outside of California is going to be a tremendous benefit to all of us. Right. That is a tremendous project and really encouraging and inspiring to hear that it's right here in San Bernardino County and quite possibly the largest private investment ever uh, conducted, ever taking place in our county. So, um, Dr. Wolf, please talk about how the Transit Authority collaborates with other agencies and stakeholders to plan and implement these transportation projects. Well, certainly transportation uh, doesn't stop at county lines. Right. And so it's critically important that uh, you know I work very closely with all of my counterparts, uh, whether Riverside, Orange, um, Imperial, San Diego, and Los Angeles counties, uh, to make sure that the investments that we're making, the projects that we're planning, uh, these take a long time to plan and develop, but that that they will there will be continuity as you get to county lines. Uh, we also work very closely with the state of California with Caltrans. Uh, on these projects to, to make sure there's there's that continuity of investment. So with that said, um, please expand on the role of public-private partnerships um, and how that plays into advancing transportation infrastructure and services in San Bernardino County. We have two examples, right? We have the Bright Line and the Barstow International Gateway. Please talk about how those partnerships advance transportation infrastructure. Well, having the uh, private industry come to the table to help solve transportation challenges uh, is really important. Uh, the public uh, sector cannot afford to do everything on its own. And so having private partners come to the table is huge. Um, so whether it's the Barstow uh, International Gateway, which is going to alleviate some of the truck congestion that we deal with today in the, the Metro Valley area, uh, whether it's Brightline coming in to provide rail service connectivity uh, across state lines, we have other examples where we've had private partners step in. Uh, we extended the Metrolink system in the eastern part of the valley here, nine miles to the University of Redlands. And a, uh, both the University of Redlands and a private company called ESRI uh, in the western part of Redlands actually invested in the stations at their stops uh, because they wanted something more, but they also saw the value of the train uh, being an attractor to getting people out of their cars. And so there's, uh, you know, I'm talking about San Bernardino County, but the private sector is a really, really integral component to what we do on success in building large transportation infrastructure projects. Right. And I, I just, I love that you do partner with Esri, which for those that may not know, Esri is the largest global imaging systems um, uh, corporation in the world, right? Um, Esri is the go-to for measuring all things in <laughs> in traffic, in, uh, um, you know, patterns of weather, in population, and how traffic moves, and following all of those patterns, um, Esri is the go-to. So, and it's remarkable that it, they're right here in Redlands, again, another innovator that is just a great asset and resource to our region. Um, yeah, so tell us, uh, Dr. Wolf, also what measures are being taken to increase the sustainability and environmental friendliness of transportation systems in the county? So the, the project that I talked about, the self-propelled uh, hydrogen power trains, the first of its kind in North America, and may actually be the first of its kind to truly be operational throughout the world. Mm. Uh, and so we are, you know, as an agency, we took the leap of faith working closely with the California State Transportation Agency, uh, who's funding this prototype. Uh, but the all the tests uh, uh, are coming in perfect. The train uh, is exposed, expected to be operational uh, and introduced for service by Metrolink uh, early this fall. And yeah. imagine, you know, a lot of the emissions that we we deal with in the San Bernardino Valley, in particular, but throughout the LA Basin, are generated by heavy duty trucks and trains and ships and planes. Right. 
So if we can make this leap of faith and, and move uh, trains, at least passenger trains at this point, uh, using uh, a technology that doesn't generate emissions, imagine where that'll lead us to in the near future. Absolutely. Like you said, it would uh, relieve congestion on the freeway and relieve the pollution uh, that we see as a natural result of um, some of those trucks. Although I understand also we have that 2030 initiative where trucks are supposed to be zero emissions, but that will be, uh, you know, tough to reach. But hearing that um, you have this rail system already in place with those uh, pieces in motion, um, it's very exciting to see that uh, we will be the first county to be able to tout that um, incredible technology and um, just remarkable. Yeah, so, another um, thing I want to point out is, you know, I talked about uh, highway capacity, you know, adding capacity to highways. We don't just pave, right? One of the things that we're trying to do is to help to push the envelope uh, closer because when we talk about zero emission truck technology, it's either going to be battery electric or more likely for heavy duty trucks, it's going to be hydrogen. We don't have the fueling infrastructure in place today, right? You don't have, not every gas station has a hydrogen uh, pump as well, right? And so we need to invest in that. So we're working uh, in concert with private partners as we expand uh, capacity on the 10 freeway or as we expand capacity on 395 in the Victor Valley to incorporate those into the projects, to start to help to build that infrastructure that's gonna be essential to meeting those, those uh, state legislated uh, mandates for zero emission uh, movement of goods. And so what do those private partnerships look like for those fuels to um, you know, get our next generation of transportation moving? Um, are they excited to start building out the infrastructure? Is the timing going to work out? I know there are a lot of moving pieces when you look at these projects. Um, what say you, Dr. Wolf? So uh, the, at the state and federal level, um, a lot of money is now being invested in this very infrastructure. And so there's a lot of private interest now because there's a lot of money flowing uh, to create this. And also, you know, technology is is sort of on the cusp. The, the uh, technology for these heavy duty trucks, for example, hydrogen heavy duty trucks is almost there. Right. And so now the next thing that needs to happen is build out the infrastructure. And then we got to struggle with how do we how do we uh, deal with fleet turnover? These these new technologies are not cheap. And so there's going to be some challenge as well into the future, but we're at least trying to do our small part to help to advance uh, this part of technology. So with that said, um, are there other modes of transportation that are under your purview? For instance, are there plans to expand or introduce new modes of transportation, such as bike sharing programs or electric buses? So uh, electric or hydrogen buses, definitely. Uh, you know, we, we don't operate bus service here in, in the county. We've got multiple uh, smaller uh, organizations that, that provide that bus service, the largest being Omnitrans, whose buses run all around the, the Metro Valley area here. Um, and so we work with them on, you know, what it's going to take to convert. And in fact, the states legislated that they convert their fleets. Um, and so we're investing uh, in tens of millions of dollars over the next decade. Uh, to facilitate, uh, you know, transferring those fleets from CNG or diesel, whatever they're operating today, to uh, either battery electric or hydrogen. Now, that's going to be critically important. With respect to uh, to bicycle infrastructure, you know, we work on projects that, that build uh, or add bike lane capacity where it's appropriate. Uh, a little different here uh, in our communities, as you well know. It's a little warmer out here. And so, um, you know, we're not building quite the same infrastructure that you might see in the Bay Area and other areas where the climate is more conducive. Uh, but we certainly are adding that infrastructure where we think it's appropriate. So other, in addition to, uh, you know, uh, joining uh, Southern California Business Report on KMT 1498 AM and 98.1 FM, what are other ways and other channels you use to keep the public informed about transportation updates and project progress? Now, it used to be you could just uh, pull a two-page ad in the uh, Sunday Times and you've got it, right? Uh, everybody read the paper. That Things have certainly changed now, and it's actually much more challenging to, to really reach out to the population as a whole because there's so many different platforms today. 
Some people still read the paper, but very few. Uh, social media has, has certainly uh, taken uh, front and center stage in there. And so we have uh, we have people that are very adept at uh, social media um, that help us to, to, to do that outreach. Community meetings, conducting community meetings, working through the city councils. Uh, so trying to, to uh, you know, get our message out on projects that are going to affect particular communities. But even then, I, I think it's the, the change that we are witnessing and, and the rapid change in, in how people communicate is a very challenging aspect of our daily jobs here in, in the transportation world. Because how do you, you know, what we do touches so many people. Right. But how do you get to them? How do you how do you get their interest? One program that we started uh, is on a specific project uh, near my office. Uh, we engaged the local elementary school. And so we had a program, right, hoping that the children would then go home and say how excited they were that they get to watch, be a part of this, and then their parents could learn about it and ask questions. So you have to be innovative today to, to figure out how to get your message out. Yes, absolutely. Especially with something as critical as infrastructure, right? Because I know anytime I'm on the freeway, I have questions, especially when there's construction, which as we were talking about, the 210 freeway seems to be like the only freeway in San Bernardino County that is completed. But you also commented on the fact that the latest project in Redlands was completed. Can you please talk a little bit about that project? So we, uh, there was a gap in, in uh, the number of lanes as you headed east of Del Rosa on the 210 freeway through Highland into Redlands to the 10 freeway. And we just added, uh, we closed that gap. And that project literally within the last couple of weeks uh, was uh, just completed. So actually every freeway in this county has, has pretty much had, if it's not under construction today, uh, it was recently uh, under construction. And you're right, that creates challenges for people when they're, when they're trying to drive to work, drive to school, do their daily activities. Um, you know, you just have to leave a little bit earlier and recognize that the benefits in the end will outweigh the pain that we're suffering today. That's right. So, uh, Dr. Wolf, please talk a little bit about some of the challenges that the Transit Authority faces in implementing transportation projects and how are those challenges being addressed? So, money is uh, always a problem. Uh, Right. It's, it, transportation projects are extremely expensive. And when you have, it seems like when the state or the federal government invests lots of money, new monies into our world, um, then the costs go up, right? Because you've got more projects that are out on the street, which then draws down on the labor pool and the supply of materials. And so those costs go up. So an example right now is, you know, I talked about Brightline coming in. That's a $12 billion investment in the two states. That's a huge project, right? The biggest project that we have under construction is just under $1 billion. So imagine the, the labor and materials that that project is going to suck up over the next five years, right? And so we're constantly trying to balance that. Um, and then, you know, just working through the process of getting projects through the development phase ready for construction is a lengthy period of time. So you as a consumer, as someone who's driving down the freeway, may say, why don't they fix this bottle? Or why can't I have more uh, buses uh, providing service here? But there's, there's a process that we have to follow, uh, both state and, and federal laws, um, that lead us to decisions on what we're actually going to do to solve a particular transportation problem. And sometimes they can take more than a decade to work through. And that, you know, that's frustrating for all of us, uh, but, but it's important because you need to make sure that the investment you're making, which is a long-term investment and a very costly one, is the appropriate investment that meets the needs of the community into the future. Absolutely. And so with that said, we're heading up to a break. So everybody listening, I'm Yvette Walker with ABC News and Talks, Southern California Business Report here today with Dr. Raymond Wolf, Executive Director for San Bernardino County Transit Authority and an update on investments in state-of-the-art technologies to provide a seamless and efficient transit experience while also ensuring accessibility for all. Upcoming transportation projects and initiatives, including the Brightline Project in the largest county by square miles, in America when we return. Hey. 
the University of Laverne is rated first in California for alumni satisfaction. Learn more about accelerated programs offered online and on campus in Laverne, Irvine, Ontario, Burbank, or College of the Canyons. Visit go.laverne.edu. The University of Laverne. Go.laverne.edu. Hi, I'm San Bernardino County Sheriff Shannon Dykus. If you're looking to start an exciting career in law enforcement and make a difference in your community, we are hiring. Dispatchers, nurses, deputies, laterals, and many more. For a complete list of our jobs and more information, visit sheriffsjobs.com. Ontario International Airport is on to a better way to fly with over 65 daily non-stop flights to more than 20 major destinations and the easiest airport experience in Southern California. Visit flyonto.com slash Ontario to learn more about Ontario International Airport today. Hi, I'm Dana Rademacher with MGR Property Management. A lot of people wonder about the value that property management has for their property. Property management can include all property types, including residential, commercial, and HOA. It is valuable because property managers are experienced in what can happen at your property. We're aware of liabilities. We're able to do predictive and preventative maintenance. We know what is coming up with the changes in the weather, the seasons, how old certain aspects or different capital projects at your property are. We're able to best negotiate contract pricing, legalities with your tenants, and anything else that you may need to ensure that you're getting the full value of the property. If you're interested in speaking with the representative at MGR Property Management regarding your property management needs, you can visit our website at mgrrealestate.com or you can call our number at area code 909-581-6600 to be connected with the representative. Cal State San Bernardino is home to the only School of Entrepreneurship in California. With globally ranked degree programs, you can start your journey today to become a successful entrepreneur. Learn more and connect at entre.csusb.edu. We are the Empire Strikers, the professional sports team of the Inland Empire. We are a fast action and community inspired pro indoor soccer team. Our mission is to inspire the Empire. Home games, community events, watch parties, and youth camps are all back. Professional indoor soccer is back. Join us and come watch the greatest show on turf at Toyota Arena or on Twitch. Visit www.TheEmpireStrikers.com for more and any information. Welcome back, everyone. Yvette Walker with ABC News and Talk, Southern California Business Report, here today with Dr. Raymond Wolf, Executive Director for San Bernardino County Transit Authority, and an update on investments in state-of-the-art technologies to provide a seamless and efficient transit experience while also ensuring accessibility for all. Upcoming transportation projects and initiatives, including the Brightline Project in the largest county by square miles in America. Thank you again for being with us today, Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Yvette. So prior to the break, you gave us, you know, a general overview of some of the more critical projects that are occurring in the county and the innovative technology that is coming, you know, so innovative that it's groundbreaking in North America, which is extremely exciting. Um, so with that said, let's talk about, you know, um, some upcoming projects or initiatives aimed at reducing traffic congestion in high volume areas. You know, we have the 60, we have the 10, we have the 210, we have the 15, right? The Cajon Pass. Uh, please talk about some of the more um, critical initiatives aimed at addressing those high congestion areas. So, you know, traditional uh, uh, projects are continuing. And so highway widenings, we have a very large project that's been underway on I-10 from the L.A. County line in Claremont, east I-15, uh, for about four years now. And I know that the traffic through there has been a challenge for a while, but uh, the work is almost done. And we are actually uh, getting ready to break ground on a similar project on Interstate 15, uh, building north from Canto Galliano and Riverside County up to Foothill uh, Boulevard in our county, adding two uh, tolled lanes uh, in that corridor in each direction to try to help to manage the traffic flow in that congested area. 
We talked about Brightline before the break, and one of the things that Brightline is bringing to the table in, in our public-private partnership uh, is c- uh, limited commuter service through the Cajon Pass. The Cajon Pass is a very challenging uh, area to geographically to, to add capacity. Uh, we are concerned that the Cajon Pass is uh, potentially uh, you know, <clears throat> ripe for a wildfire uh, shutting it down as it had a few years ago. It's very susceptible to that, uh, or a major earthquake, right? And so, you know, we're we're trying to be judicious in the type of investments that we're making through the Cajon Pass, uh, but we think that adding a commuter service through there uh, will be attractive because, as you know, uh, there's a lot of truck traffic in that corridor. They have a lot of fog in that corridor, and at this time of year when the clouds are low and it's raining or potentially snowing in there, it can be very challenging to drive through that pass. And so if you have the alternative to not drive the pass, but instead to take the train, uh, that's going to help to alleviate some of the, the congestion through there. Right. And so what are the, what's the vision for that train? What route would that train uh, be taking? They're effectively going to follow Interstate 15 through the Cone Pass. So they'll uh, either be in the median or they'll be, I believe, on the north side. So they'll be they'll cross over here and there, uh, wherever it makes sense best to, to build the infrastructure that they need. There will be a station at the top of the hill in Hesperia. And that'll be the collector station to uh, for commuters to come down and connect with the Metrolink system in Rancho Cucamonga. Wow. So is that the same route that Brightline is taking as well? Well, that's that's going to be the Brightline route. So they will just basically, you know, in the the morning, the peak commute direction is from Hesperia down to Ranch Cucamonga in the evening. It's the reverse direction. And so providing uh, that service for that connection as part of their water service. Wow, that's that's amazing. I'm really excited about that. So uh, let's talk about how the Transit Authority prioritizes projects and allocates resources to different areas within the county. So we actually are what they call a self-help county. And that means that the voters in this county have enacted a half-cent sales tax dedicated to transportation investment. And so when we went to the voters originally in 1989 and then back to them in 2004 to renew that measure, we had a very specific list of projects that we were going to deliver. And so we are now working through that list of projects. We have a board of directors that has a representative from each of the 24 cities and towns. And then all five of the board of supervisors are on my board as well to help guide uh, the conversation of, of which investments are we working on next. And as I talked earlier, you know, these projects take years if not decades to deliver and so we we put together what we call a 10-year delivery plan that we then update every other year to just to help to keep continuity in in the programs and projects that we're advancing right so what is talk about what that's like too right because you have to be very patient very diligent very structured in your approach for these um, infrastructure projects. But what is that feeling when you're able to see the finish line and, you know, say this is a completed project after, like you said, years and possibly decades? Well, I, you know, it's a uh, euphoria in, in some instances, right? If you, if you uh, start your career and you're working on a project and it takes you 15 years to get it across the finish line and see it realized the the beauty of this career is you can actually see something it's tangible right and you can see the the positive impact that you're having on people's lives by creating more opportunities for them to move uh, around uh, to to do the daily activities that are so important to them that's what i love about this job Wonderful. So, uh, Dr. Wolf, talk about any plans to incorporate smart technology or innovative solutions uh, to optimize transportation systems, in addition, obviously, to the Brightline and um, uh, the hydrogen uh, train as well. So, we're actually working on what we call a smart county plan uh, in partnership with the county of San Bernardino, uh, looking at, you know, broadband implementation across the county and uh, 5G looking at then how can we leverage technologies that are evolving around that space to help with understanding the flow of traffic and how to better manage traffic 
um, to, to look at things like that. So um, data is the key, right, uh, to, to really being able to effectively better manage systems. And so having that infrastructure in place is the first thing that we need to be doing. And, and so we're, we're definitely working uh, in that direction in partnership with, with the County of San Bernardino. And what do those infrastructure assets look like? So um, whether it's cameras on uh, every street corner, whether it's cameras on the traffic uh, uh, signals um, to be able to better see what's going on, to then adjust in real time so not have to have a maintenance crew go out and change the timing in a signal box, uh, but actually be able to adjust it from a central location. That's the kind of technology we're talking about. So um, more automated sensors to control the traffic lights and the flow of traffic um, throughout San Bernardino County, it sounds like. Yep, absolutely. Wow, that's exciting because there is a light here that just takes forever. And I'm staring at a road with no you know, cars going down and I'm thinking, there's got to be a better way to do this. We'll talk <laughs> offline. But, but as an example, uh, Corridor, we, we just uh, partnered with the City of Ontario and Rancho Cucamonga on the Haven Corridor. And we redid the timing uh, along that corridor, and it actually is working really, really well. So, now, now, with that technology, are you looking to implement AI as well? So AI is the buzzword for everyone, but but AI certainly is it's going to take over uh, how how you use visual data and data in general, right? Um, and uh, so it will whether we're looking to deploy it or not, it's coming. Right. It's coming in every aspect of our lives. Absolutely. So, um, Dr. Wolf, can you talk about any initiatives to improve uh, first and last mile connectivity and enhance overall community experiences for our residents? So this is one of the uh, one of the biggest challenges. Right. And, and uh, I think Uber and Lyft really helped to change the conversation around first and last mile solutions. Because prior to them exploding onto the marketplace, we were trying to bring in, you know, shuttle buses to try to move people around. But you're limited in the number of stops that you can and still be effective to, to provide service, right? So you can't meet the needs. We're, we're so dispersed here in Southern California that it's really challenging. And so having uh, services like Uber and Lyft has really changed that conversation a lot. Where it makes sense in some of our communities, you know, we'll look to implement bike pro bike share programs and the like. Um, but I think honestly, uh, uh, looking unless you have a major employment center that's near a transit facility, but you don't have the connectivity, then you create that connectivity with some sort of shuttle. I think relying on on private uh, companies to fill that void is really the direction we need to go. Right, because um, allowing the private sector to kind of fill that gap means that you're not on the hook for the investment, right, or the upkeep and the infrastructure. Yeah, and a lot of times the private sector is more innovative than the public sector, right? It takes us longer sometimes, unfortunately, to, to come up with grand ideas. And the private sector has different motivations, and if they find a niche that, that they think they can fill, they can do a much better job than we can. Right, which is exciting to hear about these major investments by the private sector because, you know, the fact that they see the opportunity, they're coming at it from a business-minded perspective versus, you know, a consumer services as an entity of, uh, you know, the county. They are actually seeing the potential of the investment. And if there is no ROI, there is no investment. So obviously, they are seeing uh, the, the opportunities here in San Bernardino County what opportunities do you uh, find them seeing uh, when they make these investments in our county? So I think, um, you know, our elected board, I talked about the 29 member board that I serve, uh, just has really been open to embracing new technologies and to looking at new solutions that are outside the traditional boundaries of how we've tried to approach problems in the past. And I think that has really helped. I think I think we have fantastic leadership in this county, and that's bringing investment into our county. 
I, I wholeheartedly agree because it's about the leadership. It's about the innovators. It's about the people that are putting in the work and really dedicated to serving their communities. And for that, I feel extremely blessed to be here today. Um, Dr. Wolf, uh, has the Transit Authority conducted any studies or assessments on future transportation demands and growth patterns in the county? If so, what does that look like? So we're seeing actually a lot of investment in housing in our communities I, I spoke to earlier, particularly focused uh, along major transit corridors, which is new for us, right? Now, we're still seeing a lot of single family uh, sort of suburban development that's occurring, particularly in the high desert. But as you look more into the core areas, particularly along the Metrolink corridor, as an example, in San Bernardino, uh, whether it's Montclair, uh, whether it's Upland, whether it's Rancho Cucamonga, Fontana, Rialto, uh, Redlands has, has got tremendous development from the nine mile extension that we just started operating uh, Metrolink service in within the last couple of years. So that's the kind of thing that we're seeing. So that, that it brings a different demand to the table, right? Less of the single uh, occupancy vehicle and more transit investment. So we are constantly trying to balance our investments to meet the demand. But we're not going to run, you know, 10 minute uh, bus service or train service when the densities don't support that today. But long term, that's the direction that we're heading. So we're making investments to set us up for uh, that capacity, that capability in the future. But also recognizing that we still need to make investments on highways because the, the goods movement uh, through the San Pedro ports is not going away, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we can't ignore that as well. Absolutely. So, um, Dr. Wolf, please talk about the ways the Transit Authority engages with the community to gather feedback and address public concerns regarding transportation projects. So when we have, you know, when we start a project, uh, we have, there are requirements, whether it's embedded in state law or embedded in, in uh, federal law to engage the community, right? So the affected community. And so you start with public meetings. So you've got to notice those public meetings. And this is where, as we were talking earlier, the challenge is how do you reach the broadest uh, segment of that population? And there's just so many different ways that people receive information today. It's a lot more challenging. But, um, you know, we, we bring people in uh, with communications backgrounds that really help us to, to accomplish those goals. That is terrific. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about these major projects, the Barstow International Gateway, um, the Brightline Project. The Brightline Project alone is going to require 11,000 people to build this one project out. And that's just one of the th three major ones that you mentioned, including uh, the tunnel that's going to connect um, the Bright Line to Ontario International Airport. Please talk about workforce development efforts, uh, what exists, what opportunities there are, and how you're engaging the community to fill that uh, pipeline for workers. So, you know, any opportunity we have to uh, to reach out at the high school level, at the junior college level, at the college level to engage with, um, you know, <clears throat> organizations that, that have those contacts, working with the superintendent of schools, Ted, Ted Alejandre, uh, to get the message out. There's a lot of really, really good jobs in this space, right? And you, you don't have to be an engineer. You can be a planner. You can be a communications person. You can be an English major, right? Because we, we need help in the entire spectra in order to, to deliver these projects. And, and these are great paying jobs. And again, as I said, the, you know, you've got tangible things to show uh, the impact that you're making on your community. Right. And so what are some common misconceptions about pursuing a career path in this field that no longer exist, right? When you look at technology, like you said, it covers the complete spectrum of needs for filling these positions. I think awareness is the biggest challenge, right? I think a lot of people just aren't aware of the different, the, the plethora of different types of, of career choices that you can make in the transportation space. And, you know, so whether it's us at the agency, the, the public, uh, uh, level or whether it's consultants that do a lot of work for us or it's the contracting industry 
the labor unions. Uh, over the last uh, 10 years, we have all seen this coming, right? And so we have tried to, to uh, institute programs to try to, to educate people on the opportunities that exist across the spectrum, whether you have a high school diploma or not. There are jobs, good paying jobs in this industry. Um, Dr. Wolf, talk about um, the potential for apprenticeship. Do does SBCTA offer apprenticeship opportunities for you know maybe students that are coming out of high school that may not know what they want to do but are interested in exploring transportation and infrastructure? So we we don't offer uh, those kind of programs at that level. We do internships with uh, people that are in college. So we partner with whether it's uh, UCR or Cal State San Bernardino. Other institutions to to provide those opportunities. Uh, we do work with professional organizations like Women in Transportation Services uh, that do have programs, apprenticeship type programs and uh, scholarship programs, and so we work uh, with them in, in that aspect. I just don't have the right fit for someone who's just coming out of high school in, in my particular agency. Okay, so can you talk about um, what skills, what type of education is looked at most favorably uh, by SBCTA and what a career can look like for somebody that is new, that is exploring and interested in entering uh, the transportation field? Well, so again, that, that's a tough one to answer. So you can have a degree in engineering. So that, that kind of pushes you down a path of project management, construction management, um, design uh, management. You could have a communications history or, or English background, uh, in which case, you know, the, the career trajectory would lead you more into the communication side of the house, uh, the political uh, and legislative uh, support side of the house. So really, uh, you know, we can we can use just about any background, just depending upon the type of job we're trying to fill. We're also, in, in addition to being the transportation uh, authority for the county, we're also the council of governments, and so we delve into housing issues and and things, uh, air quality uh, issues, uh, things that are, you know, quite a bit different than the transportation space that that we fill. And so we've got there. There's lots of opportunities. Um, I just encourage people to to get on our website uh, and take a look at the the programs, the projects uh, that, that we engage with, people that work here, and uh, you know, reach out. I love that. So, Dr. Wolf, what are you looking forward to as you look into the future of infrastructures in San Bernardino County, infrastructure projects in San Bernardino County? Well, I, I'm just excited at the innovation that, that this county has embraced. I'm excited at the innovation that my board of directors has embraced and I'm, I'm just looking for what's the next thing right so we've, we we're going to have the first interstate high-speed rail uh, connecting into our community we're going to have the first hydrogen powered um, passenger train in our community we're starting to one of the first that are building out the hydrogen charging infrastructure for trucks we're trying to look at uh, introducing an autonomous vehicle solution vis-a-vis uh, -vis the tunnel from the Cucamonga Station to Ontario International Airport. What's that next thing, right? And so maybe it is using AI to help better manage uh, traffic. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure what that is, but it's exciting to know that we're going to have that opportunity to embrace whatever that new technology is. Um, we're not just using technology because it's new and exciting. We're really being thoughtful of what we're trying to accomplish, what problem we're trying to solve. And what's the best way to do it? And, and traditional solutions aren't always the best. Right, which is interesting because when you're looking at technology, new technology, emerging technology and sustainability while addressing, you know, uh, a challenge in overcoming a barrier, uh, that's got to be a really complex and exciting problem to solve. It, it's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being with us, uh, Dr. Wolf, and for sharing your insight and, um, you know, an overview of what's happening in San Bernardino County and these tremendously exciting projects. Thank you, Yvette, for the opportunity.
All right, everybody. So everybody listening today, don't forget to find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Check us out on scbrtalk.com. Don't miss my interview with Megan Barajas and John Chapman. Megan Barajas is the Inland Empire Regional Vice President for the Hospital Association of Southern California. HASC is a nonprofit 501c6 regional trade association dedicated to effectively advancing the interests of hospitals in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. Megan's focus is on public policy and advocacy for hospitals in the Inland Empire, supporting 36 general acute care hospitals, three long-term acute care hospitals, four acute psychiatric hospitals, and four rehabilitation hospitals. John Chapman is the president and chief executive officer at San Antonio Regional Hospital in Upland. Mr. Chapman joined the hospital in 2018 and is currently serving as the seventh president and CEO in the history of the hospital. San Antonio Regional Hospital has 363 beds, a staff of over 500 physicians, 2,000 employees, and 300 volunteers. The hospital offers advanced patient care throughout the Inland Empire. John also currently serves as a CEO chair for the Hospital Association of Southern California, as well as serving on the board of directors and second chair for the Inland Empire Economic Partnership. Next week, we will have County Supervisor Jesse Armanderas, who was elected to the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors in November of 2022. County Supervisor Armanderas was born and raised in San Bernardino County. A strong believer in hard work, Supervisor Armanderas earned his first job pressure washing trucks for a local logistics company at 16 years old. He eventually completed an apprenticeship program to become a licensed mechanic after graduating from uh, his first class at A.B. Miller High School in Fontana. He started his own small business and Supervisor Armanderas currently serves on the board of directors for the Inland Valley Association of Realtors. You do not want to miss it. We will see you all next week.